You're watching Your Money Live. Well, Telstra has now apologised to shareholders for not meeting their expectations when it comes to the pay packets of senior executives, all in a hope to avert a shareholder revolt at the Telco's upcoming AGM, which happens next week. Is that a little too little too late, though? Certainly an interesting topic. Let's kick off our panel debate for tonight's Taking Stock. Joining us is entrepreneur and investor Jack DeLosa, founder and CEO of The Entourage, and CEO of social enterprise Grameen Australia. Kat Dunn joins us as well. Thank you you both so much. 30% they're going to cut bonuses at Telstra, uh, which is incidentally about the same amount that uh, dividends came down. Mm. So, I mean, is this exactly what needed to happen? Kat, what do you think? Well, I think it's really interesting because it's so, um, it's so tempting for us to say that uh, executive pays are too high and that um, it's a good thing to apologise to shareholders. But that's sort of beside the point. I think the real point is our constant obsession with management incentives being aligned to shareholder interests. Um, and that's precisely, I think, the kind of dangerous thinking that leads to something like big banks um, charging dead people for money. Because if you're interested in um, looking exclusively at increasing shareholder profits as your only metric for performance, um, then that leads to a lot of dangerous outcomes um, in order to get those profits. So I would say that it, you know, it's not all as it seems in making that apology. Mm -hmm. What do you think could be some other ways to incorporate? And I'm going to open this up to the, yeah. to the group in a minute, but that was a really interesting point. What, what do you think is a kind of a, a better way to, to kind of get better returns for everyone involved in the business? Well, I think the, um, the, the measurement shouldn't really just be managed, shouldn't just be shareholder interest, but um, a broader view of who your stakeholders actually are. So there's customers, there's shareholders in the broader society, and the debate right now that's raging as a consequence of what's happening with the Royal Banking Commission is should there be a, an obligation for companies to have a social license to operate and think about all of the shareholders, um, all of their stakeholders, not just their shareholders? Mm -hmm. And that's a really important question I think should be put to yeah, the chair. This becomes a very deep question because essentially we're asking here, it's, does business have an identifiable obligation to society? That's like a, that's a... It's a structural shift in how we think yes. about business and how it's all structured and that, that's why the, the, the work that Kat does at Grameen is just so powerful because it's all about societal change. I think in this instance with this story, you know, it's my view that we need the best talent in the world yeah. running our businesses. That's in the interest of the shareholders, it's in, in the interest of the customers, it's in the interest of the economy. Uh, you know, the average CEO salary in the US is 11.7 million, right? And the, the main person under the magnifying glass here is the CEO of Telstra, Andrew Penn. His salary has gone from 5.6 to 4.5. So his, his, his earnings are going down. The, the, the bonuses have been cut by 30%. Uh, Telstra in a really high pressure, high demand environment right now, which means their management would be under a lot of expectation, under a lot of stress, working incredibly hard. Um, so I actually agree with everything they're doing. I don't, think, I don't think anybody's being paid too much. I think that it is in our best interest to pay our executives even more. Surely the Does that go for politicians as well then? Politicians is a different kettle of oh, fish altogether. <laughs> Don't we need the best talent in our country? Well, we do need the best talent in our country. It's tricky, doesn't it's, it? it? It gets tricky when you're talking about performance, and I think that comes back to another structural question about you know how you incentivise politicians. Um, the, you know, the, the equation for CEOs like Andrew Penn is: Do I run Telstra or do I go over to San Fran yeah. and I go over to New York and run a business over there? Brain drain. If that starts to happen at the big end of town, that's not good for anybody in this country. Yeah, yeah. but but Jack, the problem with Telstra is that dividends are down significantly, profits right. are down significantly. Right. The, the, the board has and the executives have not been doing a good enough job. No. So this, this decline in salary is, is what should be happening. No, well, that's I think not the true. the question is why, right? Because well, well let, me, let me address that. They're, they're in a very challenging market position. You've got NBN coming out. So Telstra's profit was down 8%. It's, it's too simple an equation to say profit's down, therefore yep. execs aren't performing. Exactly. The profit could have been down 18% if it wasn't for some really good management performance at an executive level in the, in the company. So, so it, it's too simple an equation to go profits down, therefore they're not performing. It's not, it, the two aren't necessarily correlated. But it's very difficult to draw a straight line between one and the other, right? There's a, very, there's a lot of opacity in how these bonuses are structured, short term, long term. I mean, it's surely too much for a regular shareholder, a mum and dad investor to know how on earth they're getting these, these huge sums. Yeah, and, and it, it's actually an interesting point. The, the apology today was not for 
extensive bonuses or for the amount of remuneration. It was around the transparency of the metrics that the bonuses are tied to. So they actually didn't apologise for the amount of money anybody's being paid. They apologised exactly for that. And so I, I think that is the issue, which is how do they be more transparent and more clear so that the mum and dad investors in Telstra do understand. Mm. I imagine, Kat, you've got a view on that. Well, I, I do, yeah. because um, the... I think a lot of this is fear of going against shareholders' expectations. There's a real fear of um, not hitting, quotes and quotes, mm -hmm. our projections for that particular quarter. And that's a really interesting perspective because um, the question isn't so much that shareholder val well, dividends or shareholder value is down. The question is why. Um, if you um, wanted to actually take a long-term view, there are some expenditures that absolutely are rightfully meant to take a dividend down because it gets reinvested into the business. Why? So that it can innovate and create opportunities and better products innovation for customers, customers who will help to keep the business growing, acquire more customers, get more value and long-term be able to sustain a business in a, in a sort of systemic way. So I don't think it's enough to look at the analysis, well, why is there an 8% drop or X% percent drop now? I think the question is why? And if there's a good enough reason, then any person leading an organisation should be able to conv convince shareholders um, otherwise because it is in their best interest. Let's yeah. go right to the smaller end of town, guys, because we've heard that uh, the small business tax cut will be <laughs> brought forward by five years. Uh, you're, you're smiling ear to ear. <laughs> <laughs> Does it get chatted about amongst... Uh, no, amongst never. Interesting. Yeah. Why, just pocket it, that's what I deserve, move on? Why? It's it's a material you know we're talking th these these tax cuts from 27.5% to 25% it's mm -hmm. material 3.2 billion dollars to you know um, in terms of cumulatively across the board so that that's a material amount you know at a small business level do small business owners talk about this stuff not really um, you know 2.5% of their profit while it is you know it's relatively material it's it's just they've got bigger concerns and bigger things to think about uh, I think the tax cuts are an incredibly positive thing you know if as a business person as a taxpayer and as you know a really proud Australian citizen I would prefer capital and cash to be in the pockets of innovative Australian business owners who are actually innovating and doing meaningful things with it than in the coffers of the government right now. Through what means? What's the best way to do that? I mean, well, we seem to be splashing around election money already, so mm. well, how do through, you do it? Through, through the tax cut, right? So 2.5% is coming off the company tax rate, so that means there's more profit that will be retained by the business owner rather than paying that money to the government. And I, I, I like that allocation because I think that, you know, I, I, I back the individual and the entrepreneur to be firstly more scrupulous well, with their spending. That, Small business doesn't really chat about it yet. We'll just take it. But yeah. you, what about yeah. things like investing somehow? You know, in incentives for startups, that type of thing. Is that is that crucial alongside, or the well, tax cut is enough? Well, I, I, there's substantially more the government can do to, to accelerate startups and, and enable more businesses to, to start and prosper in the country. You know, and, and a lot of that was done in the innovation agenda a couple of years ago, which was a really promising move from the Australian okay. government for, for the startup scene in Australia. And so, yeah, small business owners don't talk about this sort of stuff. They don't look at the budget. They don't talk about it. It's, it's really not material for small business owners. But in my view, you know, all things being considered, it's a positive move. Kat? Kat, what do you think? Is this money well spent by the Morrison government? Well, I think the answer is sort of twofold. The first one is it's really interesting that a smaller company is deemed to be up to $50 million. I don't know what the average revenue is for your um, entrepreneurs and your members, Jackie, but I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, $50 million doesn't seem like a small business. That's probably the first comment I'd have. Second comment is it was actually World Mental Health Day yesterday, and that's really relevant because when we're thinking about an economy where there's a product and wage gap. You've got um, a government saying we've uh, at an all-time high in GDP and we've got wages remaining stagnant. Is it any wonder that employees and people around the country are feeling increasingly disconnected, increasingly lonely, increasingly um, sort of in this state of ill mental health? And when you think about what tax cuts are going to do, that's $3.2 billion across 3 million companies. I guess you have to ask yourself, well, what's that money that, that's otherwise going to go to government, um, go, going to be spent on by business? Is it going to be spent on more innovation so that customers have a better experience? Is it going to be spent on more shareholder dividends to uh, satisfy the likes of Tel Telstra shareholders? Or is it going to be spent on looking at the increasing the wages of employees and salaries of employees around the country um, to perhaps give them a little bit of a, a leg up in circumstances where the cost of living is going high, higher, but 
um, their wages are remaining the same. So I think in that context, it's probably premature for Josh Frydenberg to say that those tax cuts are going to be um, uh, opposed or challenged by a Labor government if uh, the consequences of them is an increased livelihood for employees of Australia. So perhaps a bit more guidance then as to what they well, uh, could and should be useful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if, to the point before, businesses, if they are going to have the benefit of tax cuts from the government, the question mark there is, do they really not also have a social licence to operate? I don't look at it necessarily as this just good for business because um, business is part of a big system so you've got to think about what is the system consequence of that. Speaking of uh, a particular small business, one all the way in Belfast, uh, one a bit of a landmark case to, uh, today or, or this week uh, on whether or not it was or should be forced to um, make a cake that it religiously does not agree with. This is of course the gay cake which had Bert and Ernie uh, on the front and supported mm -hmm. um, you know, the civil liberties there. Uh, this is a religious freedom versus civil rights issue but a small business finds itself in the middle. Jack what do you think? Yeah I, I, this is obviously really tricky uh, territory to navigate at the moment and, and there was two stories here so, so there was one story where somebody refused to put um, you know a, a cake together that was supporting a gay couple and then there was another one that was refusing to um, you know, put slurs that were sort of anti-gay onto a cake. So, um, you know, I think it's 2018. I think that human rights uh, should prevail and that uh, anything that promotes hate needs to be looked at and addressed. And I think that the proprietor has all of the rights in the world to not engage in that kind of work. Uh, and I think that anything that promotes love between two people, wh whomever they may be, is a really positive thing. Mm. What do you think? It's so funny because the primary um, argument for the judge for saying that they uh, let this one slide was because it violated religious freedoms. Now, I 100% support marriage equality mm -hmm. and I'm also Catholic. And so I don't think those two things necessarily go um, out of order. They're not mutually exclusive. And if anything, in this day and age, um, the denial of supporting somebody's wonderful day is a violation. It, to, the idea of not supporting somebody's wonderful day is actually religious um, uh, overreach, violating their human rights, freedoms and ability to be included in society. So I think this one, um, you know, signals that the courts may be um, significantly behind uh, than what we have called for and seen in Australia. Couldn't agree more, that's really well said. One of, one, someone gave me the example though of you, the case basically said you also couldn't say to a Muslim printer you have to um, to print this you know cartoon of, of the Prophet Muhammad because that would be insulting to him. It was put to me that the example is the kind of the equivalent that the baker said well I don't have a problem with you being gay but I don't like I don't like writing th you know things that I don't political messages I don't agree with so it's very nuanced and as you said I think it's kind of really tricky territory um, but it's interesting to, to see given we've had this kind of exact debate mm. like last year and into this right. year um, you know in Australia as well. Violet Crumble can we talk that? Uh, kind of got, <laughs> come back into the local shift. home. I know there's no segue in the world but, I liked it. No, you did well. talking <laughs> sweet, sweet things. Uh, yes I mean our, our overlay uh, vision shows Kit Kats which come into frame which is my favourite and far more so than the Violet no, Crumble. That's completely. Same. Yeah. I'm a Kit Kat man. And don't, don't try and give us the crunchy caramel or anything, just the original. It's straight up Kit Kat. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's something I do like about Violet Crumble. They've stayed true to just their Violet Crumble. That's what they are. You know what to expect. They haven't tried to mess around with the with the flavours. I'm psyched about this. I love Violet Crumble. I love that they're back in Australian hands but I do want to hear what, what Kat and Jack reckon. What do you think? I think this is a hugely positive story, right? You've got a century-old <laughs> recipe in Violet Crumble. Admit, I've got to disclose my bias. I'm more of a Kit Kat man. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm pro-business. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-economy. And I think that from a structural perspective and even a social and philanthropic pers pers perspective, the, it benefits everybody, right? So uh, in, in this acquisition, moving it over to South Australia, you're going to have more energy, more investment, uh, more focus put on a great Australian brand that's going to rejuvenate focus into it so I think it's a really good story.
Kat? And I think South Australia, of all places, needs it. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that because I'm from country WA. <laughs> we have a long-standing rivalry between um, our various football clubs, which will make no sense to you guys because you follow that other code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is, it is a relatively low number of jobs, and the, the Premier of SA did yeah. say that. It's 30 jobs, and so that, that's great, but it, it is wins quite a, a low number. As I said, wins business wins, prevails. Good news and story. And yep, I like it. Thank you so much, guys. Kat and Jack, good to have you. We'll see Thank you next you. time. Thank you.